So I'm Chris Frost, uh, I work for Datico, and my approach to this is a little bit less academic and a little bit more dewy. Um, we worked with a client on a small project and we've kind of enhanced what we've been doing since. Um, and we basically wanted to see what we could do with unstructured data and kind of putting that data at the fingertips of the users, not only the users in, as in the practitioners, but could we, put the, could we take that data and then put it into a format that could be used for, say, more data analytics, uh, more data analytics or even data science. So if we look at the two charts here, we can see that um, unstructured data by the year 2020 is expected to take up uh, more than 80% of all data collected by organizations. Now, I'm not sure that that's true for EMP, but it does definitely show the direction that um, the world as a whole is moving, and it shows the importance of being able to harness unstructured data. Now, I think within EMP, um, we definitely focus on this part much more than we do on this part. This part only comes in when we want to find the context. But when the data that we don't want isn't, isn't in here, then it, the reason why is almost certainly in here. So we should be looking at this data to try and harness either reasons why, try and find that data, and put that data at the fingertips of the people that need to use it. Uh, the graph at the bottom, again, we've got the same kind of trend. And you can see last year the revenue in billions for Amazon Web Services um, on their cloud uh, on their cloud platforms almost doubled in two years. Uh, and that just shows that people are you know, starting to wake up to this, the use of this analytics uh, and using analytics to kind of take this unstructured data and uh, garner information from it. So working with the client, uh, we were basically told to tell them something they don't know. They delivered us with uh, a data set um, of a few hundred end of war reports, final war reports uh, of all different <laughs> ages, um, different qualities, all in native image format, which I'll, I'll go through uh, getting that into um, a format that could be used. So once we had it into that process, we wanted to use natural language processing to try and find the context of that information. Uh, extract data from that if we could find it. So physically find tabulated data within reports, could we get that out? And then once we'd got that data out of a report, could we QC that? With those results, could we present that to them? Could we present relationships within the data and information in a different way? And we, could, we prevent, uh, could we present the information and context? So what is unstructured data? I'm sure you all know. Um, but we, st we stayed away from the semi-structured data. We went to unstructured data, but the data set that we were delivered uh, was mainly in image format, which meant that we needed to run it through OCR, uh, so optical character recognition, uh, to get it into an actual unstructured data set that could then be analyzed, uh, run through our taxonomies, and then uh, used to present those results. So the platforms that we, that we used, um, although this is not a um, big data piece as such, you know, one of the Vs is missing in, in this kind of data, and that's probably the velocity. Um, although if you look at it from a time constraint point of view, you could use this kind of approach for something like a merger and acquisition or a data room scenario where the time constraint is much tighter, then velocity does become much more important. Um, that time frame, say it's a couple of weeks, that's where your, your velocity comes from. So these are quite you know, generic platforms for, um, for big data pieces, I guess. But we wanted to use these because we wanted a platform that we could roll out. We could roll it out on the cloud. We could roll it out with another client if we needed to. We could easily install it in-house, um, create a cluster, a cluster of computers using computer images and, uh, and do this quite quickly. So again, trying to fit it within a time frame that would be correct for a client. So where does, the, where does this unstructured data reside? So as we look through kind of a hierarchy of, say, a file system that contains um, documents that we want to 
get this information and the data from. At each step, there is information that we can take out of there that gives us more of an idea of what data and information we can get from these documents. So if we look at the taxonomy, we can work with file paths and file names. Uh, if going through to documents, we can look at them quite high level. So if it is more structured, such as a Microsoft Word document or something like that, you can look at headings, you can look at titles, we can look at cover sheets for documents, uh, and we can also just look at the metadata of the document itself. And then as we work through pages, we can run sentiment analysis, probably not to the level that Paul does, but we, um, we could try that. Uh, we can look at keyword searches within a sentence. We can uh, do natural language processing, uh, and that re uh, then moves through to part of speech tagging, which can really give us the relationships and the, content, uh, the context of that data. So we took what I call a hybrid approach. Uh, the technology is fine, but having the knowledge and the the kind of architectural understanding of how subsurface data looks, um, how it can be transformed, and how it's harnessed, was very important into uh, in getting to what we called the implementation sweet spot. So, kind of taking these in equal parts. And we're not just talking about the tacit knowledge here. We're talking about taking the, oh, we're talking about taking these two and kind of formalizing that, creating taxonomies, creating lists, um, using that information in a way that we can feed into here. So our technical approach, we basically took the uh, taxonomy information um, and fed it into the matrix here. Uh, structured data was out of scope coming straight from the data store. But what we wanted to do was take information, extract that from here, use this information to tell us whether there is data with, <coughs> residing within a document. And if it is, can we put it through, mine that information, and then put it out to a spreadsheet? If it's information that we find within the document, can we mine that text, and then could we dashboard it? Or could we use a graph database to look at relationships within there? So first, we'll look at the taxonomy. So in order to do this, uh, we started out by deduplicating the documents. Uh, obviously, reworking information and using the same source of information twice is, I mean, we've seen numerous times up to 20, 25% of information within a file system is duplicated time and time again. So deduplicating that first was paramount. Um, then we utilized our proprietary tool set, which basically uses uh, taxonomies of over 400 categories to kind of look at the information, understand that, and then index it so we can target high-profile data types uh, and link those to these potential analogs, such as you might find core information in an end of world report, a geological end of world report. So by doing this, ranking the information using the scoring system, we were able to kind of take each well um, show the gaps uh, that weren't available and do this in a relatively quick time frame. So again, if we're talking about the velocity, the velocity piece, um, can we get this information back to a client in a kind of a fast time frame so they can then make decisions on where they, where they want to go with the data, what's important to them, what can we do in a relatively quick uh, turnaround. So at this point, we don't know whether this is true or not, but we're using a best guess to kind of see, uh, you know, if we've got a geological end of world report, well, then if core information is available, then it will be there. So next we go through to the information extraction and text mining. So the first thing we need to do is take image information and turn this into the un unstructured information, which means OCRing. And by doing that, rather than just taking a generic OCR process, uh, we undertook pre-processing of information and then post process that information. So we did this in a number of ways, uh, improving image quality by lifting contrast and uh, trying to take fuzziness out of pictures, um, convert to black and white, various other methods, um, improving OCR capabilities. So using the correct typeface, uh, creating training sets for the OCR process, 
uh, and ensuring that the image quality is at the highest quality possible. So is it the correct DPI? If not, can we upscale it? Once we've OCR'd, uh, we would then run through post-processing, which basically removes any kind of uh, fuzziness that may have been incorrectly OCR'd, uh, and then that created the final output. So this is kind of a run through of that process um, all the way through to, at the end here, part of speech tagging the uh, sentences. And that would be used to uh, then do the analysis piece and create the context within the sentences. Now, one problem that we always have uh, when we always had when OCRing was the misrecognition of characters. Um, so running this through a generic spell check engine, um, which are available openly, was not great. Let's put it that way. Um, we've got a lot of the information that we have uh, within these documents is bespoke to the oil industry. Uh, you have well names, um, geographical locations and such, which are not picked up by a, a generic spell check. So we created listings of uh, thousands of words used within EMP, within geology, within different, um, uh, the different, different disciplines. Um, so we ran our documents through this spell check. If it wasn't picked up in there, we would run this through closeness engines, try and find <coughs> words that were close to the words that were misspelled. Run this through a statistical spell check um, using machine learning algorithms. And then hopefully we would come back with a uh, word at the end that was the correct version. This would then be fed back into the document and the word would also be fed back into the EMP spell check. <coughs> uh, there was a manual QC check at this point, just to make sure that we weren't feeding anything ridiculous back into the system. So text mining. So we ran this against um, our data-specific listings and our uh, data-specific taxonomies, which basically gave us a score and uh, a number of occurrences. As you can see in the, uh, in the diagram. So this would give us a, a good indication, an overall score um, as to whether the information was in that document or not. This was done on a page by page basis, so we could link back to a page um, and basically say whether that part, that, that, that type of uh, data was found on that page. So at this point, we have a fully OCR'd, unstructured data set. We have information about the data that's on that page. So could we then extract the data, mine that data, QC it to some extent, and then put it into a spreadsheet for an end user? So this is the process that we used, um, and an example of some of the data that we'd be dealing with. Um, I would say that pro one of the biggest problems that we indicate, um, one of the problems, that, the biggest problems that we saw, was the fact that data, the data that was within these documents was in, uh, it was in so many different formats that it was quite hard to write regular expressions that would always pick it up. But by refining this and coming up with rule sets, we were able to collect most of the data scrape it out and to put it in spreadsheets. So here's uh, one of the results. Uh, we can see on the left that we've got, uh, sorry, on the right we've got a table and on the left we have the data that's been extracted. So alongside doing this, we wanted to provide some level of QC. So at this point, when the practitioner picks up this information, could we highlight problems within that data set. So rather than them having to go and check each data point, could we highlight something statistically? So by um, looking statistically at uh, each column, were there any outliers within this? Um, looking at type of characters in there, is it a string or uh, is it a number? Uh, if there's a string and a number column, then that's potential misrepresentation of the data and could we uh, then we would highlight that for whoever went in to do a, 
specific QC, uh, they can easily pick up on those points and correct that. So we put this information into a dashboard, uh, linked it to a spatial interface, uh, and created a search functionality. Um, you can see here that when we look at the results, we have uh, a result and a page number, which basically took this the, the final result for each page and ranked it as you would with a Google, uh, I, I guess with a Google search. One thing that we learned was that, you know, there's numerous places in a document that you may find information about the same data, the same data type. So we didn't want to just point to one place within a document. We needed to have a ranking system so that people could kind of go in, open the, doc, open the document using a link to the page, which would open another window and see which was relevant to them. Going on to the next step, we were able to create relationships between um, the kind of data types, keywords that we found within those data types, um, and the pages themselves. So by lemmatizing words, basically putting them into uh, a standardized data set, we were able to put them into a graph database. Um, graph databases are a much better match to the way a human might look at relationships, rather than having tables and joins, we have nodes and connections. So we can see here uh, we have the word sandstone. So I ran a query to find everything that within this document um, to return sandstone, and we can see that on page 94 we have coring information about sandstone. So that's linked to the core. Uh, on page 82, we have information which is linked through core and formation. So we may think that that's a description of a sandstone within a core. Uh, and on page 77, we have a show. So that's somebody describing a show, um, the sandstone within a show on page 77. We've also got other information to do with shows on that. So that's allowing somebody to kind of see in a graphical interface um, what information is available about sandstones. If we look at more of a data type approach, uh, up on the right-hand side here, we can see that I searched for sidewalls within a document. Uh, there are two occurrences, one talking about just core itself and one talking about formations. So we would think that the, in page 54 is most likely that that is a core description, and uh, on page 94, maybe talking about... Uh, Sorry, maybe more, more talking about um, the recovery of the core itself. Okay. Another example. Uh, so we can just look at the word relationships themselves. So if we look here, we've got core descriptions uh, for the whole of a document. Now this is for the whole of a document, but you can imagine that this could be for a well, a field. Uh, these nodes can link back to a document. They can link back to a page in a document. Uh, they can link to a sentence within a document. Uh, we can see here we've got a sentence, uh, we've got information in this part. This is all linked together about core sample preservation and in this one about core recovery. And then we link through to uh, an actual real life example where within this document we're talking about problems within the well that are causing uh, basically cost implications we have uh, more talk about the core in problems in here, a modification of programs, and then going through to talk about the percentage uh, recovery and bits of actually running the core in program itself. So by clustering these together, we can uh, recover this information. Thank you.